Of course, when we say, I won't be moved, evidently that doesn't have to do with the way some of you are seated this morning because (laughs) it's a little bit of an inside joke, but there's this whole switch where half the people that usually sit over here are over here, and half the people who are over here are over here. Now, what this represents when you're a pastor is that there's plotting that's gone on in the congregation. (laughs) that there's a hidden agenda, that there's something happening behind the scenes. I'm not sure what that really would be, but I have questions this morning. I have questions. We have questions about a lot of things, don't we, in these strange days. What would it be like if we could really understand the times? Like those famous men of Issachar from the Old Testament who understood what to do because they knew the times. They understood the times. We're working our way through the book of Revelation, and I've got questions just like you do. One of the things we're going to see this morning and in the weeks to come, we we ask the question, I think if we're honest, if we're paying attention, we'll, we'll ask the question, how on earth will things ever get this bad? But then some of us are asking that question every day, aren't we? How on earth, note that on earth, how on earth will it ever get this bad? One of the truths that we find in the Bible, but really affirmed in the book of Revelation, is that cosmic dimensions, a a, a cosmic conflict, in other words, what happens not just merely in this physical scene world, events on earth are first determined in heaven. The book of Revelation tells us that there's a coming conflict at the end times here on earth, but it's preceded by a climactic conflict in the spiritual realm in heaven. And that's what's referred to in our text this morning. Open your Bibles, please, to Revelation 12. Because what we're going to find here in Revelation 12 and in the chapters to come, they really are a backstory. They're a backstory to what will happen at the end. The chronology of Revelation, in a sense, has hit pause, and Jesus giving to John through the Holy Spirit a vision of what will happen in the end days, there's backstory that fills in the details about why those last days will be so terrible. And so what we'll find this morning is we'll find the great dragon. Next week, we'll find the two beasts that are added to the evil agenda of the dragon, And all of this advances the drama. Satan has an unholy trinity. By the way, you know that Satan always counterfeits. Whatever God does, Satan tries to duplicate. And over the next few weeks, at least after Easter, when we return to Revelation, what we're going to find is that, indeed, there is an unholy trinity that will be active in the last days. And all of this is setting the stage for the final confrontation which will result in Jesus' ultimate victory and the setting up of his intermediate kingdom on earth, leading to his eternal kingdom. There's a cosmic conflict that is going on. The old preachers used to call it the conflict of the ages. It has happened all through time. It it is engaged now in the spiritual realm, and it will be climaxed and culminated in the end days. Now, what I want to remind you of is this. Even though the details, and I'm worried this morning that we'll get lost in the details. I have concerns about that. But as we look at these details, I I want you to recenter your thinking on the fact that there are implications in these ultimate end times events. There are implications for how we invest and live our lives every day. The warnings about the conflict that is culminated in the end times, that conflict is happening today and we see glimpses of it. Can I use the word skirmishes? We see skirmishes of it in our own hearts and lives. That's what I hope to show you before and through today. But we're in chapter 12 and it seems the best way to deal with this material is just to work through it in four sections. So that's what I'll do. And the first section basically shows how the conflict of the ages has played out on earth. How the conflict of the ages has played out in history on earth. So let's begin this strange vision with these symbols that are symbolic of something real in these first verses that has already taken place. Look in verse 1. Revelation 12, and I remind you, 
This is God's word for us today. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head were a crown of 12 stars. Literally in Greek, it's a mega sign. It's the word mega. It's for a great sign. And And there's something important and central that is symbolized here. And of course, if anyone knows their Old Testament, this is reminiscent of Genesis 37. Remember Joseph's dream about the nation of Israel and his his mother and and the 12, his 12 or 11 brothers, all of that vision out of Genesis 37. Look at verse 2. She was pregnant, this woman in this mega sign, this great sign. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Now, let me stop again. All through the Old Testament, Israel is pictured as a woman in travail, as a woman who is going to give birth, as a woman who is in physical distress. That's a constant theme throughout what we call the Old Testament. And in fact, if you go back into chapter 11 from last week, the last vision we saw in chapter 11 was a vision of the Ark of the Covenant, Israel's demonstration of God's care or God's care and his demonstration of his presence with Israel that's the last thing that happens in chapter 11 and then you have this vision of this mysterious woman there is every evidence that this is ethnic Israel this is Israel the Old Testament people of God at least in these first verses look at verse 3 and another sign so the first sign is this mysterious woman who is symbolic of the people of God under the Old Testament, Israel. Now look in verse 2, excuse me, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. This vision is grotesque. It's otherworldly. These horns and these heads and these diadems, these crowns on the various heads, likely indicate that he has presumed authority for himself. And it's also a demonstration of great earthly power. I mean, if you walked out this afternoon and saw this dragon, you would be impressed. (laughs) You would be impressed. You would be stunned. And you would be fearful. This is a fearsome, fearful sight. Look at verse 4. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This is very likely a demonstration of his original fall that we won't get into this morning. But remember when Satan fell, he took angels with him, fallen angels, who are sometimes, angels are sometimes called stars. And so likely this is an indication of the evil that now we call them demons, the fallen angels who fell with him. It's an enigmatic reference to his original fall. The middle of verse 4 says, And the dragon stood before the woman. Here's the primary vision. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So there's danger here. Verse 5. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. I guess we know who that is, right? But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. By the way, my son Ryan, who literally has written a book on preaching apocalyptic literature, he calls this his favorite Christmas passage. He believes this is a Christmas passage here. Because it's the birth of the Messiah. Whether the the woman, whether this is literally that birth in Bethlehem, that's not so much the point. The point is, out of Israel, out of ethnic Israel, God sent a deliverer. Out of travail, God sent one who would rule. And so this plot line, this vision... It would have been familiar to educated first century people. It is echoed in other uh, pagan, in pagan cultures. It is echoed in, in mythology. The idea of a bloodthirsty usurper who is waiting to devour a newborn prince. And ultimately, that usurper is killed by that prince. We have, we have examples in ancient Near East cultures of the same kind of, of gruesome picture. But what God does here is he takes this and he uses this familiar image to educated people in the first century, and basically he says, listen, this has really been happening. There was really a tension, a warfare. There's an effort toward bloodshed, and it's been playing out on earth since the garden. This vision is an overview of the antichrist type attacks on the people of God in the Old Testament, the people of God, ethnic Israel, and it began all the way back in the garden. It was promised by God. You remember? It was predicted by Him. 
When God cursed the serpent, by the way, the serpent shows up in our text this morning. When God curses the serpent, who is basically the dragon, when God curses the serpent, he said, there will be a deliverer. There will be one who will come from the seed of the woman, and though you will bruise his heel, he will bruise or crush your head. And that began in Genesis 13. Chapter 3, it began the drama of redemption. And the serpent, the dragon's evil intention toward this woman's unborn child, it traces all the way through what we call the Old Testament. What do you have soon after that promise in Genesis 3? You have Cain's attempt to murder Abel, right? You have the corrupting of the line of Seth in Genesis 6. You have the enmity that happens between Esau and Jacob. You have the murder of the male children in Egypt. You have the military exploits against the Messianic family, beginning with Pharaoh when they are released from captivity and going all the way through the divided kingdoms. You have the attempted murder of King David, who is Messiah's ancestor. You have Haman's attempt to slaughter the Jews, told in the book of Esther. And you also have the temptations all the way through what we call the Old Testament to Israelites to murder and sacrifice their own children to the false gods. And there's a sense in which what we call the Old Testament is an encapsulation of that song that we sing at Christmas time. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom what? Captive Israel. That's what you have. That's, this is the conflict of the ages that's been played, been played out on earth. And then you enter what we call the New Testament, and you find there's an ongoing attempt by the dragon to devour this child of the woman after he was born. How did it begin? Well, remember, it began with the assault, the attempted assault upon the child and the murder of the children in the regions of Bethlehem. You have in Jesus' life and ministry the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness you have the climax of these attempts, the crucifixion of the Messiah. And at that moment, there must have been some confused and morbid excitement that the evil one has finally devoured the child of the woman. But there was a surprise coming. We're going to note that surprise in two weeks from now on Easter Sunday. Amen? The conflict of the ages. And by the way, even with the ascension of Christ... It hasn't really ended. You have the historic, rabid, ubiquitous anti-Semitism that is in so many cultures. You have the pogroms of history. And you have the terror of the Holocaust in the 20th century. Now, the point of this, the title of the sermon is A Glimpse Behind the Curtain. All of these things are happening and are played out in history. But what's going on behind the curtain is the effort of the evil one to prove the God of Israel a liar by making impossible his covenant promises. He made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. There would be a land, there would be a seed, there would be blessing. And from the beginning, all the way back from the garden, the serpent who is cursed in the garden, the dragon, the deceiver, the accuser, as we'll see in our text this morning, he has been on an agenda. He has been on a hunt to destroy and to do away with Israel, the special people of God. And therefore, you come to Romans 9, and you find the promise in Romans 9 through 11 that God is still going to fulfill his promises. And Satan says, not if I have anything to say about it. This is the conflict of the ages. And this is the way it's been played out so far on earth. Beginning in verse 7, we see how all this conflict will be culminated in heaven. How it will be culminated one day in heaven. Look at verse 7 with me. Follow along. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And I watch the identity markers here in verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down... That ancient serpent, who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. By the way, this event that still is future, it's future when John sees it, it's future for us as well. This event is the culmination of this conflict of the ages that inhabits in heaven. Jesus saw the beginnings of it during his earthly ministry. 
If you go and read Luke chapter 10, you remember Jesus says, it's as though I saw Satan falling from heaven. I liken this to the D-Day invasion. If you know your World War II history, there's a sense in which when the D-Day invasion was successful, the Third Reich, they were on a ticking clock. In a sense, it was a done deal, but there was plenty of conflict and plenty of battle to go. And that's what you have with the coming of Jesus, and you have his earthly ministry, and he says, listen, there's a sense in which my kingdom is here. Interpretively, this is what Jesus said. And even on the cross, you remember he said, it is finished, and yet we look around and we think, is this really finished? And in a sense it is, because it's the guarantee of God, but there's still this conflict that is ongoing, and there will be this ultimate conflict in heaven that we read about here, and finally Satan and his forces will no longer have access, and the point of their access, watch this, the point of their access is to accuse people like you and me. He accuses the brothers, as we'll see in the text to come. He is cast out of heaven. This is the activity we see in the Old Testament. Uh, it's in the book of Job, which, by the way, I think it's fascinating. Scholars think that likely Job was the earliest writing of the Old Testament. It was either contemporaneous with the writing of the Pentateuch, or even perhaps earlier than parts of the Pentateuch. And so, what do you find with Satan in the earliest record that we call the Old Testament? You find Satan accusing Job, remember? You have Satan accusing. He comes before the sons of God appear before God, and he accuses the faithful followers, those who are faithful. And we find in the prophet Zechariah the same thing. You find that he criticizes and he accuses the faithful leaders of Israel during that prophet's time. This is what he does. He somehow, up until even today, Satan somehow has access to the throne of God so that he can accuse. But what do we read in Romans 8? We have what? We have an intercessor. We have one who intercedes for us. But there will come a time when God will eventually say, in this process of the working out of the conflict of the ages, there will be this battle in heaven, and Michael and the angels will do battle against Satan, and they'll be cast out, and God will say, accusations in my presence, no more. There's a result that happens here, as we'll see. But this is still future. And it is the, the culmination of a battle in heaven that overflows into our world. That's what you find. So you find even the odd, as we work through Revelation, we think, there are all these weird cosmological signs, what's really going on? But there's a battle in the spiritual realm. And the spiritual realm affects the worldly, earthly realm. And that's what you're going to have. That battle will be culminated halfway through what we call the tribulation period, that seven-year period at the end of the time. Halfway through that time, the conflict of the ages will be culminated in heaven after it's being played out on earth. Third thing, in verses 10 through 12, notice how this conflict of the ages will be observed in heaven, the culmination, the victory. Note how it, it will be marked. It will be celebrated in a sense. There's also a warning, though. Look in verse 10. It says, and I heard, again, the vision continues, I heard a loud voice in heaven, the voice is not identified, saying this, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. By the way, don't miss that. What have we seen in Revelation so far? The dangers on earth during the last days are for those who are rejecting God. They are called whom? They are called the ones who dwell on the earth. But here, there's a reference to those who dwell in heaven. There's a distinct difference here. And the ones who dwell in heaven are to rejoice. But at middle of verse 12, see it? But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And so this song out of heaven helps us understand the significance. It helps us, helps us grasp what's happening 
It, it helps us see that even though the evil one in the end of time, in the middle of the tribulation period, even though he will finally lose his access to heaven, this only infuriates him more. And his target are the people on earth, especially the ethnic Jews who have come back to their Messiah. They become his target, just as they have been all through the Old Testament. And even ethnically, they are attacked today, especially in the end time, when they come to faith in their Messiah. They become the object of his great scorn, his great hatred. But there will be some who are faithful. Some Jews, some Gentiles who come to faith, and they are faithful, and they are faithful, experiencing the wrath of the devil, experiencing this battle in space and time here on earth that overflows out of the cosmic realm, and they will experience persecution even unto death. That's the reference, the reference here. To the fact that in their love of life, they shrank not from death. The message translates it this way. They weren't in love with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. They weren't in love with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. That's a pretty good paraphrase. And Jesus said it this way. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, if you're willing to give it up, if you hold it lightly, that's the way you will gain it. You have to make that choice because there's a conflict that goes on. There's a, there's a conflict that we live in the middle of. We live in this conflict and, and the problems, the, the challenges, the persecutions, all of these issues that we struggle with, they are part of this conflict that's overflowing out of heaven onto earth. And, and we, we have, have to, to make a choice. Are we so in love with our temporal life and temporal comfort that we're willing to lose our soul? Or are we willing to put our future in the hands of the great God and gain our eternal salvation? Jesus says this. In fact, it's one of the few sayings that Jesus repeats in all four of the Gospels. Jesus makes it clear. You love your life too much now, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to give up your life now, You'll gain it eternally. This is the implication behind this ultimate text here where it says, in their love of life, they shrank not from death. The fact is, believers all over the world are experiencing this kind of heartache, this kind of trouble, this kind of persecution, the wrath of the evil one. Even though he's not yet cast out of heaven, this battle is ongoing, this conflict is ongoing. And even though we might not be ethnic Jews and the Old Testament people of God, nevertheless, he hates the church of God as much as he does Israel. And therefore, for Jesus' followers today, they experience social marginalization, personal slander, economic discrimination, physical assault, imprisonment, sometimes death. But also, we deal with false teachings and temptations to sin and deceptions and a lure to conform to this world system and apathy and compromise and discouragement and sometimes despair and depression. These are spiritual matters. They're spiritual afflictions. They're, they're the attack of the evil one upon us. They're part of this great conflict of the ages. And don't think you'll escape because you're, you are relatively insignificant. For the rabid hatred of Satan is to do away and to destroy the good gifts of God in the life of every single one of us. This is the conflict of the ages. It's played out on earth in the past. It will be culminated in heaven in the future. It will be observed or celebrated in heaven. Uh, beginning there in verse 12, let me show you how it will be intensified on the earth. After Satan is cast out, the details continue. This is what it will look like as the dragon, Satan, and his two beasts pursue it redeemed Israel, the Jews at the end of the time who have come to faith in the Messiah. Look at it beginning in verse 12, the last part of the verse. But woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Stop right there. What does that mean? It just means he's enraged. It just means he's, he recognizes even further perhaps that he's defeated and he's going to take down as many people as possible. He's going to do as much damage as is possible. So look at verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, ethnic Israel, who had become believers in Jesus. 
verse 14. But the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, symbolic, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. By the way, this is language out of Exodus. This is a description of how God delivered the people of Israel through the wilderness. You can read about Jesus warning about this in Matthew 24. If you go read Matthew 24, Jesus warns this is what's going to happen to the people of Israel in the last days. That they might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to a place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half a time. That's three and a half years. By the way, skip back up for a moment to verse 6. Some of you thought I skipped it. I did on purpose. But the narrative picks it up in verse 6 where it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. If you do the math in the ancient calendars, that's also three and a half years. The same time frame as the witnesses back in chapter 11. So look at verse 15. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, likely a symbolic flood. Some people think these are the armies at the end times to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. So in some way or another, there's supernatural deliverance for these Jewish believers. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. This is a grim picture. It's the culmination, the climax, really, of the conflict of the ages. And when he can't reach Israel, because somehow God is protecting at least a portion of his people, I think likely the 144,000 who were sealed, and as he protects those, he goes after the other Jewish believers, and he goes after even Gentile believers with rabid hatred at the end of time, at the end of what we call the tribulation. Forces bent on the destruction of God's favorite people. That's what you have here. But you also have God's promised ultimate protection and deliverance. Now listen carefully. Here's the question that I ask all week. I don't know if I ever found the answer to it. What's Satan thinking? You recognize that Satan is more educated than we are. And so what's he doing here? I mean, he knows what happened at the cross. He knows there's an empty tomb. He knows Jesus reigns. From his original fall, with his desire to be like or equal to God, from his original fall, he has seen history play out far better than you and I can see it. So what's he thinking? What's his agenda? I came up with two possible answers. One, I think we can say with a level of certainty. If he's a defeated foe, he's made up his mind he's going to do as much damage going out as he possibly can. He will try to ruin and destroy everything noble and good and pure and honorable. He will recognize everything God cares about and he will do his best to destroy it with a passion. Now, I think we can say that with some level of certainty. But I still have this question about Satan. Does he know? Or is he a fool? It, is he so filled with folly that he still thinks he'll conquer the God of heaven? You say, well, that can't be possible if he's as intelligent as you think he is. And indeed, the Bible tells us that he is intelligent. But here's what I want to suggest to you. Even based on what we see going on in our culture right now, let me just quote an acquaintance of mine from social media this week. Being godless makes one a moron. Being godless makes one a moron. My other friend, who's a preacher who does a lot of youth ministry, he says, that more simply, he says, sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. And I suppose it's possible that Satan is so blinded with his hatred that he still thinks he can conquer the God of heaven. One way or another, what's clear in Revelation is he doesn't quit until he is ultimately defeated. This is the conflict of the ages. It's played out on earth in the past. It will one day be culminated in heaven. It will be observed or celebrated in heaven. And at that time, in his last days, it will be intensified on earth. 
Now, now let, let me use the rest, rest of my time this morning to try to apply this to our lives today. For a good majority of the time that Satan is doing this, I believe that those of us who are Jesus followers who are part of the church will be absent from these last days. We will be delivered because it's the same time that God is pouring out his wrath. But we can expect to experience some of the persecution of either the Antichrist or definitely the spirit of Antichrist, which has happened all through history. So we need to recognize what's happening here. Let me just suggest it this way. I'm going to boil it down for you and then try to apply it in your life. This is the conflict's primary ultimate issue. The question is this. Who will reign? Who will reign? For instance, in your life and in my life, day by day, who is ruling? Who is in control? We have to make a decision, and there is a sense in which if we fail to acknowledge and live in light of the fact that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Master, then we are yielding to a different kingdom. And we have a description of that kingdom in verse 9. Would you look at it again with me? Go back up and look at verse 9. Look how this one is described. By the way, before I read it, let me just suggest this to you. The, the symbol is an indication. Remember what we said about symbolism in Revelation? That it might not be a literal fulfillment, but it's always a greater fulfillment. And in this case, we would say a worse fulfillment. I don't believe that Satan is a literal dragon. I don't believe he's a literal serpent. Whatever he is, he's much worse. He's much worse. The symbolism is the best that our human minds can handle to understand the depth of evil in this. But I want to tell you that the evil one is as real as your neighbor. I hope your neighbor is not Satan incarnate, but I still tell you that the evil one right now is as real. His existence is as literal as the person sitting next to you. I hope that's also not the evil one incarnate. And we need to recognize that. It's, it, it's, it's not just some, as far too many people will do, they'll take passages like this in the Scripture and just say, oh, evil is a terrible thing, and the Bible shows how terrible it is, pretends that it's personified. No, from Genesis in the Garden all the way through Revelation, Satan is a real being. And he is described in verse 9. Now go back and look at verse 9. Look at these descriptors. And the great dragon, that's grotesque symbolism here, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, so see that connects with Genesis 3, he's the original, uh, original dece deceiver, he's the original rebel, he's the ancient serpent who is called the devil, and the word devil basically means adversary, the one who is against us and against God who is called the devil and Satan, and the term Satan means slanderer, the one who slanders, or a liar. And therefore, what is his activity? Look at the end of verse 9. He is the deceiver of the whole world. Now, I want to be as simple and as applicable as I can possibly be in the moments that remain. Who is ruling your life? Because if you are giving yourself over to the philosophies of this world, if you are giving yourself over to the entertainments of this world, if you are giving yourself over to the pursuits of, of fulfillment in this world, you will make mistakes in your life, even as a Jesus follower, you will make faulty decisions that will functionally put you under the rule of the evil one. You will live in ways, you will make decisions, you will value things that are characteristic of an evil kingdom, not the eternal, shakeable, unshakable kingdom. The conflict's primary ultimate issue is who will reign. I think in the identity that is revealed here with Satan, there are three questions we need to ask. When you ask the question, who's your master, who's going to reign, the first question you ought to ask yourself is, who has the power? Who has the power? And will you live under the rule of a trickster? Will you live under the rule of a, of a loser, one who loses? Satan is a trickster. He works through deceit. He traffics in falsehood. He's the original grifter. The King James used the phrase, the wiles of the devil. 
In 2 Corinthians 2.11, we read that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs, his desires to outwit us with deception. Who has the power? Who are you following? Another way of asking this is, are you on the winning team, or have you hitched your star to a loser? Because Satan, no matter how much power and success the evil kingdom has in our temporal world, his end is destruction. Note the progression. We're going to see it by the time we're through with Revelation. He has access to heaven. Originally, the implication of the Old Testament is he's a resident of heaven. He has access to heaven. He is cast out of heaven. Chapter 20, he's put in the abyss, the bottomless pit. And he comes to the end of chapter 20, and he's thrown into the lake of fire. We see that in Revelation 20.10. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Listen, who has the power? What kingdom have you hitched your star to? Who rules your life? Who rules your life, the ultimate loser or the Savior King? Whom do you serve? That's the question. Whom do you serve the way you spend your money? Whom do you serve the way you form your political opinions? Whom do you serve the way you hold grudges or forgive? Whom do you serve? Who has the power? The second question you need to ask yourself this morning is who has the integrity? Who has the integrity? Who, who is righteous? Will you follow? Are you following a twisted, corrupt leader? Listen to how Jesus describes Satan in John chapter 8. The devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's the way the Lord Jesus categorizes the head of this dark kingdom. But there is one who is holy. There is one who is righteous. There is one who is pure. There is one who is trustworthy. He's called in Scripture the way, the truth, and the life. Who will reign? Who has the integrity? Who rules your life? Is it the liar from the beginning? Or the one who is the truth? Whom do you serve? Whom do you serve the way you connect with other believers? Whom do you serve in the way you treat your neighbors? Whom do you serve in your commitment to the body of Christ, the visible church that God has called you to be part of? Whom do you serve? You see, if you haven't figured it out yet, what we're suggesting is that the power of the evil one, those who lie in darkness, who are not regenerated, who are not born again, those who will experience eternal separation, they are trapped in a kingdom of darkness and evil. But it is possible for those of us who have been translated, that's New Testament language, translated into a new kingdom, it is still possible for us to make decisions on a daily basis that look as though we're still living in the other kingdom. And we need to ask ourselves on a functional basis, not have we trusted in Jesus, that's important. Obviously, it's crucial and fundamental. But the way we make our lives day by day, in whose kingdom are we living? Who is our master? And by the way, if the only evidence you can find is that the evidence of your life shows that your master is not the Lord Jesus, but is this dark kingdom then you should go back and ask the original question about whether you're really in the kingdom to begin with. Because where there is, where there is root, there is fruit. We are saved by faith alone, but we are not saved by faith that is alone. There is always the fruit of spiritual life. And if the only fruit you can find in your life is fruit of disobedience and fruit of darkness and fruit of chasing after the things of this world and the things that are part of this world system, you have reason to ask yourself, have I really entered the kingdom in a real way? But these questions are still for all of us. Who has the power? Who has the integrity? And we're asking who will reign. The third issue is who has the authority? Now, I recognize this argument is a little bit pragmatic. 
But listen, I want to be part of the winning team. I, I don't want to be in a, in a losing kingdom. I mean, I've read Revelation, have you? There's a side I want to be on, and it's not this side. It's not the side of this evil one, this, the old serpent, the dragon. As much power as he shows, as much temporal pleasure as he might give, you don't want to be in that team. You don't want to be a citizen of that kingdom. Who has the right? Who has the authority? Who rules over an unshakable kingdom? Because Satan is a usurper. Second Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers from seeing the light of the gospel. He is the God of this world, but not the rightful God, not the proper God, not the authoritative, the one who holds authority, not that God. And you need to ask yourself, who has authority? Who rules your life? Is it the rebel accuser or the rightful, lawful king? Whom do you serve? Whom do you serve in your thoughts? Whom do you serve in your desires? Let me ask you this way. Whom do you serve in your emotions? Because your emotions are rooted in what you believe ultimately to be true. In whose kingdom do you live? Now, let me give you a summary. And let me talk about the importance of a truth that flows all the way through here. And we've sung about it this morning, and we read about it in Romans 8, and it's referred to in Revelation 12. This one that we're talking about, that's been the focus, the primary focus this morning, this ruler, dark and grim, he's called the accuser. It's part of the definition of his name, the devil, the adversary. He's a slanderer, Satan. He's the accuser. He lies. Go back for just a moment. Go back to the garden. His original temptation. What did he do? He functionally accused the creator of not wanting the best for Adam and Eve. You recognize that? He basically said, there's something more. That was an accusation. It was an accusation against God. It was an accusation against God's kindness as creator and the provider of all good things. He began with accusation. And his accusations continue all the way through the Bible against Job, against believers. He was the instigator of the false accusations against Jesus. He's an accuser. And so this accuser, this idea of an adversary, what happens here, there's almost a morph in the metaphors. Because the metaphor is warfare. Michael and, and Satan battling in heaven. You've got this warfare mentality. You've got it all the way through the Bible. But there's also, there's a hint to this, where there's a courtroom metaphor. The Satan is the one who's the slanderer and the accuser, but who defends us? Jesus. He's our, the one who intercedes. And that's the way we win. I'm not interested in going up against Satan in some kind of spiritual battle. I'm going to rest in the victory that's already been won. Because what did Jesus say? He said, it is finished. And the song from Revelation 12 says, how will we defeat him? The accuser of our brothers, he's defeated by the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, we're in a courtroom situation. And I find this stunning because you go back to the New Testament and all of a sudden you begin to hear this, this especially from Paul, you, you find this reading that is all forensic. It's, it's as though it's a courtroom where, where we're guilty but God counts us as innocent and it's, it's forensic courtroom language. And you see how all this ties together? Is that there's a spiritual battle, yes, but it's also a courtroom battle. It's like law and order in the, in the heavenlies. It's like a cosmic a cosmic court case where Satan does his best to bring false accusations, but every time he accuses one of us who are truly God's children, the blood of Jesus covers us. And we have an intercede, we have an intercessory, we have one who's an advocate for us. It is finished. This is how we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. 
if I had time today, I'd take you back to chapters 2 and 3, and you see that every church that is addressed in chapters 2 and 3, there's overcomer language. Insignificant churches in the ancient Roman Empire, Asia Minor, and yet they are called, in a spiritual sense, overcomers. And that is no less true for Calvary Baptist of Santa Barbara. Who pays attention to us? Who pays attention to you? Who pays attention to me? Heaven does. We're part of the spiritual battle where, while Satan at this moment still accuses us, and there's this courtroom battle that's going on, and over and over again, the blood of Jesus is pled on our behalf. And that's the reason we're overcomers. This is the ultimate death blow. And this conflict of the ages will one day be completed. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, Then comes the end when Jesus delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and authority and power. That's the victory. Let me give you a takeaway today, and I hope that you'll apply it to your heart and mind. The battle rages, and the outcome is sure, but whose side are you on? Who's on the Lord's side? To echo the words from Joshua and the great captain of hosts that came and said, who is on the Lord's side? Really? We all would say, I am. I want to be. Well, what if the accusing attorney said, well, let's open up your checkbook. See whose side you're on. Let's click on that internet browser history. And see whose side you're on. Let's see that list of grudges you've got against your neighbor across the street. Let's see whose side you're on. Let's talk, Let's talk about, about the way you feel about the leadership in your church who have messed, messed up in the past. Let's, Let's see whose side you're on. The whole point of the message is that the spiritual battle, it has implications today in worship, but it has implications as we drive home this afternoon, the way we treat our family, the way we love one another, the way we love the church, the way we get up on Monday morning, the way we go about our tasks. Every single day, we have an opportunity to show whose side we're on. And the outcome is settled. Let's make sure we're on the Lord's side. Father, thank you for the unshakable kingdom. that is ruled over by your great and glorious Son. Thank you that he has conquered our sin and our guilt. Thank you that through your power you have regenerated us and brought us into the kingdom of light out of the kingdom of darkness. And we recognize that at this time we tend to live in the shadowlands. We still struggle with our flesh. Far too often we make choices as though we live not in this unshakable, victorious kingdom, but this immediate, sensual, temporal kingdom ruled over by the God of this world. God, make us a people, and especially keep your hand upon our church, and help draw us deeper into an awareness of the glorious kingdom of the Lord Jesus that is to affect and infect our lives every day. May you be pleased as you look upon our hearts and lives, not just to see us as redeemed followers, but as faithful followers. Help us live as these martyrs live that were sung about in our text. Help us not to love our lives so much that we're unwilling to yield them up to you, but help us hold our lives loosely for the sake of an eternal kingdom. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen.